I'm sitting here in my house in Washington, D.C., and trying to make sense of my life and the way I am the way I am. I've had a long, perhaps too long, life, and I'm certainly the product of my privileged upbringing. Want of any kind has been totally absent from my experience. I was born in Paris of wealthy American parents. My father was a law professor at the University of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. President James Madison was a distant second cousin of mine, many times removed. After Paris, we lived in Philly, and I was sent to Groton Preparatory School in Groton, Massachusetts. Now, Groton is one of the world's leading private schools designed to prepare students to enter the most elite of all of the U.S. universities, and it certainly did that for me. From Groton, I went on to get an arts and later a law degree from Harvard. So Philadelphia nurtured me and Harvard polished me up. I began to speak differently, and my accent certainly changed as I worked at what I thought was a more socially acceptable Harvard way of talking. After that came what was probably the defining time in my early life, when I became private secretary to the great Oliver Wendell Holmes, the U.S. Supreme Court Justice, perhaps the greatest of them all. You know, he fought and was wounded in the Civil War. I worshipped the ground he walked on. After I left his service, I practiced law in Philadelphia for 27 years. Yes, I became a Philadelphia lawyer. Now, I like to think that to be a Philadelphia lawyer means to be an exceptionally knowledgeable and able practitioner of the law. But I know that others, more cynical, define the term to mean the ultimate in criminal manipulators of the law. I sometimes wonder which definition applies to me. Uh, politically, I've always been a Democrat, though I'm hardly a man of the people. I felt honored when Franklin Delano Roosevelt made me the 58th Attorney General of the United States. My great-great-grandfather, Edmund Randolph, had been the very first Attorney General, so it felt like keeping it in the family. Now, great-great-grandfather Randolph had later become the Secretary of State under George Washington. Though my great-great-grandfather made mistakes, he was not as bad as the clown they have over there now, Dean Rusk. You know, Rusk, last year offered to resign his position to President Johnson because his daughter, Rusk's daughter, was going to marry a black man, a fellow student at Stanford. Well, I know how he felt, but you must do what is historically just, but shut up and keep your feelings to yourself. My boss in the White House, FDR, would have hated his daughter to have married a colored fellow too, but he would certainly never have admitted it, and nor would I. Did that make us hypocrites? I frequently wonder now. When I was Attorney General during the war, one of my greatest problems, a, a constant burr under my saddle, was that commie Catholic priest, Father Coughlin. Now, that traitor to his holy calling founded an organization called the, uh, the National Union for Social Justice. Now, Coughlin had the gall to criticize FDR's social policies, including the New Deal, which had helped millions of poor folks in the United States over many, many years. The good priest, Coughlin, just wanted more free handouts to anyone who asked for them. Now, I've always said that you've got to make people work for what they get. 
You cannot simply hand them everything they want on a plate when they want it. Ah, but listen to me, listen to me. I've never been poor in my life, and I've been handed things on a plate not infrequently more times than I care to admit. I have some terrible regrets. When I look back on my days as Attorney General, I squirm on remembering caving in to the military men when I agreed to, and allowed, the mass expulsion of all Japanese Americans from their homes and properties after Pearl Harbor. Many of them never, ever recovered what was lawfully and morally theirs. They were all men, women and children, incarcerated throughout the war in miserable squalid conditions. Uh, there was never any logic and certainly no legality about any of it. I still shudder with embarrassment even after all these years. After FDR's death in 1944, I was fired by Harry Truman. <laughs> he was a rough Tough little peasant was Harry. After that, I was appointed chief American judge at the Nuremberg's Nazi war crimes trial. I was never, never so totally disgusted in my life as I was when sitting in judgment of those creatures, those sorry, evil excuses for human beings. Hanging was too good for them. Now, that was over twenty years ago, and now, I'm trying to get all these papers in order so that I can write a book about it all, as if the world needed yet another book about this miserable world in this miserable century. There's a lifetime here in memos, position papers, legal documents, judgments, anecdotes, and all sorts of other jottings and scrawlings. A great deal of this stuff, some of it from many decades ago, doesn't make any sense even to me now. Mostly, nowadays, I function somewhere between lucidity and senility, and I rarely know which is which. I need help. 